Good to see you all here. Last week, uh, Daniel Henderson gave a great message from the previous passage in 1 Peter and talked about love and how love that we have in Christ is a little bit different than our, our culture's uh, love, it's self-love. But there was one part of Daniel's uh, sermon that really disturbed me, and that is when he showed his allegiance to the Seahawks. I mean, not only that, he unbuttoned his shirt and revealed a Seahawks uh, shirt underneath. And what Daniel doesn't understand are the, the theological implications of all of this. <laughs> because uh, it tells us that at the end of time, that the victor will not ride in on a Seahawk, <laughs> but on a white horse. Yes. I want to read to you from God's Word. <laughs> then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, not a seahawk. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Amen. <laughs> oh, my Poor Daniel, what a sad afternoon he's going to have. Anyway, <laughs> there's some things that I want to uh, let you know about that are going on behind the scenes at Mission Hills before we look at our passage. A few of those have to do with staffing. Um, as uh, we have been the last year and a half been blessed by having Stu Fullendorf on our staff. I love Stu, he's great. And another church just snatched him up. Uh, he'll be, uh, actually he's already there now. It's a church in the inner city of Denver, which he loves, the inner city. It's called L2 Church. He is uh, now their executive pastor, and he gets to preach 40% of the time. It's perfect for him. It's great for him. I was very sad when he told me about that. But God's blessing upon Stu. If you don't know who that is, he preached uh, about a year or so ago, and he also was our video um, at uh, Christmas Eve service, if you were there. So anyway, Stu, Stu is no longer here, but we love him dearly. Also, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, we now have a replacement that's going to come and candidate become a candidate for our executive pastor position. Pastor Byron Johns for 15 years led an outstanding way in that position. And uh, we are now going to be calling to a candidate, uh, a man named Wayne Smith. Wayne uh, and his wife Debbie live in Dallas, Texas. Wayne and, um, and I have gotten to know each other the last few years through an organization that he is a part of called Leadership Network in Dallas that works with large church pastors across America. He's been with Leadership Network for almost nine years now. Previous to that, he was an executive pastor in, in Dallas. And before that, for 23 years, he was with a Young Life and mainly in the area of leadership development. He comes with tremendous expertise, experience, godliness, wisdom. I think you're going to love him. And he and Debbie are going to be here the weekend of February 22nd and 23rd. On that Saturday, on the 22nd at 10 o'clock that morning, uh, we're going to have a, a kind of a meet and greet and be able to ask him questions uh, that morning here in the lobby. A little bit of food to be a part of that. We hope that you can come and just meet, meet them. And then on the weekend services, we will be interviewing uh, them just briefly, and then we'll have a congregational vote for those that are members. We only vote on two staff members at Mission Hills. One is executive pastor and one is senior pastor, and that's because we're also elders, and so that's why we're doing that. So we look forward to seeing Wayne and Debbie when they get here soon. Uh, additional to that, I want you to be aware that we're making an adjustment to our Saturday service time formats. We've learned over time that our 6 o'clock service is just too late for a lot of people. So what we're having, 4.30 is, is you know, full, and, and 6 o'clock is uh, you know, way, way less than full. And so we're trying to spread that out a little bit. So beginning on March 8th, our first service will be at 4, our second one at 5.30. So if you come on Saturday night, you need to be aware of that starting on March 8th. Also, uh, one other thing I want you to let you know about two projects that we just approved getting a part, being a part of in a big way, and we're very excited about it. Our outreach department has been working on this for a long time. Our elders now put the final stamp of approval on it. One is literally halfway across the world, and one is just a few miles away. The one halfway across the world is in India. We're going to be uh, buying property and building a building there. And the purpose of that is to have a facility to help women and children who have been involved in the sex trade to get them out of that and to provide a new life for them. Uh, providing a home, training for employment, providing school for education, uh, business opportunities for training and financial stability. It's desperately needed, and we're excited to be a part of that work uh, overseas. And then just uh, down the street on Littleton Boulevard, we're going to be opening up a little a community center in Littleton. 
Uh, it'll be with outreach opportunities for us, uh, relocate our home and health, our food bank uh, ministry there, since it's right in the heartbeat of who naturally comes to that. Uh, English as a second language will be a part of that. Literacy training, uh, immigration resources, recovery services to those with addictions, uh, hopefully eventually an ethnic church plant. Very exciting of what is down the road in these areas, and we're so grateful that we're able to, to be a part of God's work in these ways. Well, let's, let's pray as we prepare to listen to God's word. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, thank you for this incredibly beautiful morning that you've given to us with the snow everywhere and the brilliant sun. Lord, it just is pure and white and reminds us of your, your beauty and holiness. Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, we, we ask, Lord, that we be open to what you would have for us, that you would move us to, to action and that we would be willing to be more like you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to picture uh, in your mind a situation that has not quite happened here yet, but hopefully we'll never get to this point. But I want you to picture in your mind that because of your faith in Jesus Christ, that now in this area, of our country and really in our country as a whole that persecution has heated up against a follower of Jesus to the point where it'll be difficult to get a job if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Your, your kids will be ridiculed in a, in a terrible way at, at school. Uh, the most vocal people will be imprisoned and even the most extreme cases executed because of faith in Jesus. And because of that, you make a choice to, to get all your belongings together and to move out of this country to a safe haven, to another country where you can exercise your faith freely. And you're there for a few years and another of other people come and are, are part of, of that area with you and it's good for a few years, but then that government begins to, to bring up the heat of persecution against you. And now you can't get a job there. And now your kids are going through horrific times once again. And, and the most severe cases, uh, believers in Jesus, are, are persecuted and imprisoned and some even killed. That's what has taken place to who Peter is writing to in 1 Peter. Exactly what's happened to them. They were people in Israel who were followers of Jesus. And because of their faith, they were severely persecuted. To the point where many of them got their belongings and left and they ended up in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is modern day Turkey. And as they were in Asia Minor at first everything was fine and it was a safe haven for them where they could practice their faith publicly and privately. But now things begin to heat up and the tension is high and the persecution is great. And they can't return back home because it's just as bad if not worse there. And it's getting extremely bad here. What they don't even know is right around the corner it's going to get even worse as Nero is going to raise havoc upon followers of Jesus Christ. And, and, and they really have uh, three options, the same three options that you might have if you, were, if you were to be in this kind of situation. Option number one is, you know, just to, to reject your faith, to abandon your faith and say, you know what, this is not worth it. The, the, the cost I have to pay, it's not worth it. I'm just going to abandon my faith. I'm no longer be a follower of Jesus. And then just fit in with culture. That's one option. A second option is to go private with your faith. Just to go private, to go underground with your faith. It's just going to be a faith that you, you express at home, maybe in some private uh, secretive gatherings beyond that. But beyond that, you don't say a word about your faith and you just try to fit into culture be, beyond your private faith. Or the third is to stand up for your faith and, and to live in a countercultural way that will cost you. And it might cost you dearly. I mean, wh what are you going to do? What's your choice? And so Peter writes to these, these Christians in Asia Minor who are going through such severe persecution to encourage them and to give them tools on what to do and how to live when the culture gets hostile against them. And who is better fit to give this advice than Peter? I mean, Peter, if you read the book of Acts, went through horrific times as well where he stood up strong for Christ in a hostile environment and he was imprisoned at times and ultimately, at the end of his life, he was martyred for his faith. I want you to take your Bibles and turn them to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. So almost at the end of your Bible, not long before Revelation, um, we do have Bibles provided. If you didn't bring one, you can turn it to page 1014. And if you don't own a Bible, we do want you to have that and to take it home 
with you today. And although our culture today is not as hostile to Christians as what we're going to see here in, the, in, in 1 Peter, our culture is heating up against the things of Christ. We are not told to hide and to run away, but instead to have an impact on our culture and our faith in Jesus Christ. And as I've shared with you in the past, I want to share with you again, it's very important to me that when I prepare a sermon, I don't just do it for you. But I do it first and foremost for me. And that God would speak to me and he would, he would move me. And I want us to, to collectively to have that attitude as we look at this passage of living the sermon. What is in this for me? To use it as a mirror to look at our own life. And to be challenged and to be willing to make some changes. Uh, the, the goal is not to survive in this culture. The, the goal is to impact this culture for Jesus. In order to have an impact, you must first of all change who you are. Change who you are. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says this. Peter writes, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, just previous to this, as Daniel taught last, last weekend, he talked about love and how our love is to be different than the love of the culture, a self-love. And he says to them, you need to stop your actions of hurting other people if you're ever going to have an impact in the culture. If you're ever going to have some kind of a, an impact for Christ, you're going to have to, to be kind to those who are around you. And instead of hurting people, you need to channel your, your focus on spiritual growth and to becoming more like Jesus. And he says there's five areas that you need to put away, five areas that you need to get rid of in your life. Number one is malice, which is a desire to cause harm to another person. Two is deceit, which is dishonest behavior in order to, to, to trick or to fool someone. The third is hypocrisy, doing you know, what you tell other people not to do. The fourth is envy, wanting to have what somebody else has that you, you don't have. The fifth is slander. To purposefully speak ill of another to cause harm to them in the eyes of other people. And Peter says you will never have an impact on your culture if you are being unkind to people. If you are being mean to people. Knock this kind of behavior off and seek instead after spiritual growth. And many times in the Bible we are told to put off the old way and to put on a new way. To put on God's way. It's called transformation. You are not the same anymore because Jesus has come into your life. That's why it says in Romans chapter 13, verse 12, So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. That's why it says in James 1, 21, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Put off the old. Put on the new. Put off the ways of culture. Put on the ways of of God. And Peter tells us to put off treating people unkindly, but instead to aggressively pursue, as he puts it, pure spiritual milk. Uh, it should be the deep longing of a follower of Jesus to grow spiritually. Just recently, I received an email from one of our key church leaders who, who wrote me a number of things in this email, but one of the things he said really challenged me. And he said, he said this. He said, if I were asked to give a challenge for the future to the leadership of our church, it would be this. My biggest concern is that we not become a megachurch full of mediocre Christians and new believers that don't grow beyond just the basic maturity. I think part of the answer is continuing to work toward simple church, not letting building expansions and campaigns programs and administrative demands dominate our time and effort over focusing on reaching the lost, growing the new believers, and challenging the complacent. What a good word. And Peter tells us that we should pursue spiritual growth to a level that a baby pursues milk. So Jane and I have had four babies in our lifetime, and this is what I learned about babies. When they want milk, until they get milk, everybody's miserable, right? So, you know, when you go on a road trip or something, you're traveling along, and the baby wants milk, you got to pull over. you got to get off the side of the road. you got to do whatever, because all of a sudden when the baby wants milk, everything stops. That baby wants milk and wants that milk 
now. Now you could offer that baby gold. You could offer that baby silver. You could offer that baby season tickets to the Broncos. And the baby doesn't want any of that. The baby wants milk and only milk. Why? Because milk is its survival. And what Peter is saying is that when you are in a hostile environment and your culture is against you, your lifeline is spiritual growth through Christ. You must become dependent upon him in the times of when they're tough and things are going against you. Grow spiritually. Change who you are. So in order to have an impact, you must change who you are. Secondly, in order to have an impact in the culture, you must realize whose you are. Realize whose You are. And we're going to look at verses 4 through 6, but I want to start with verse 6 and then go back to verses 4 and 5. I think we'll understand things a little bit better with that. And we'll see as we go through this, verses 6 and 7 and 8, there are some references to the Old Testament. Verse 6, Peter writes, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion, or in Jerusalem, a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so Peter describes here who Jesus is. He describes him as the cornerstone. That he is a chosen and precious cornerstone. And that we're to place our faith and belief in him. And you say, okay, what exactly does that mean? I mean, why does Peter refer to Jesus as a cornerstone? What does that mean? Well, a cornerstone is the first stone laid in a, in a building that starts a new work. And all else in the building is aligned to this cornerstone. And that's how he describes Jesus. The first of this work and all those who follow him are to align themselves with him. He is first. And the NIV puts verse 6 this way. As the scripture expresses it, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem, a chosen cornerstone, and anyone who believes in him will never be disappointed. Now let's go back to verses 4 and 5 and try to understand what he's saying here. He says, As you, the believers, come to him, to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so he's saying here that Jesus is the cornerstone, a living stone that was rejected by the people but precious to God. And it's interesting to me that Peter, who Jesus said of him, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, that Peter, the rock, is the one describing Jesus as the cornerstone. And then Peter says that he's a living stone and those who follow Jesus are also living stones. You say, okay, what does that all mean? Well, what Peter is saying is this. Jesus is the leader, the one who sets the parameters and the guidelines. His followers are part of what he is building, a spiritual house of holy living. And lives that are completely given to God are spiritual sacrifices to him and are part of his work. No matter how much persecution, no matter how much suffering, no matter how hostile the culture You're part of Jesus' work if you're a follower of him. So as you sit in this room, if you are a follower of Christ, then you are part of Jesus' spiritual house because you have have aligned your life with the cornerstone with him. You are his and you represent him. Realize whose you are. And when hostility from the culture heats up, remember you are of Jesus and not of the culture. You're aligned with him. So in order to have an impact, you must change who you are, realize whose you are. Thirdly, you must know who they are. And you say, well, who's the they? They is the culture. You must know who they are, what they think about when it comes to the things of Christ and how they interact with him. Look at verses 7 and 8. Again, references to the Old Testament. Peter writes, So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe... The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. 
They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Know who they are. The builders that Peter is referring to that rejected the cornerstone, rejected Jesus, were the religious leaders of that day. They stumbled over what Jesus said. They stumbled over how he lived. They stumbled over what he claimed. Jesus was counter to his culture. Instead of, of being seen as the cornerstone by the religious leaders, uh, the, the, the guide to align their life by, instead he became to them a stumbling block, a, a rock of offense. He got in the way, if you will. And nothing's changed. Jesus is still getting in the, the, the way, and he gets in the way because if you don't align your life and obey him as the cornerstone, you're going to trip over him. If you're going to have an impact for Jesus in our culture, you must understand what the culture thinks about Jesus. You must understand why so many reject him. You must understand why he has become a rock of offense to so many. I mean, many in our culture see Jesus as intolerant. They see him as exclusive. They see him as, as judgmental. They don't think that he is God. They think he's a good man or a prophet or none of those things. They don't like his stand on sex. They don't like his stand on marriage. They don't like his stand on divorce. They, they, they don't buy his teaching on forgiveness. They don't like what he says about money. They're not sold on what he says about servanthood. He's a stumbling block. He, he certainly is not embraced as the stone in which to align one's life by. You've got to know your culture. If you're going to have an impact on it and what it thinks about Jesus. And in order to have an impact, you must change who you are, realize whose you are, know who they are. And then, number four, go public with your faith. Go public with your faith. That's what he's saying in verses 9 and 10. Look at verse 9. Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter is comparing those who reject Jesus to those who believe in him. He says in verse 9 in the New Living Translation, but you are not like that, but you are a chosen people. You're different. You once were not God's people, but now you are. You, you, you once did not receive mercy from God, now you do. Verse 10. And Peter compares the, the church, the, the new believers in Christ, to the nation of Israel. When he says you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people for his own possession. And what's the purpose of this church, these believers of Jesus? The Good News Translation says it this way, to proclaim the wonderful acts of God. Or as it says here in the English Standard Version in verse, verse 9, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That you're going to go public with your faith. I was in darkness, now I'm in light. I've been transformed by him, and I want to tell you all about it. I mean, getting out of darkness and into light is we're celebrating and we're telling people about. And that's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, he said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As was mentioned, we we're having baptisms this weekend. And baptism is a declaration of one's faith publicly. It's going public with your faith. It's telling people what Christ has done in your life. And Christ says, when you give your life to Christ, you need to go public with your faith. For in, in this room, when that happens, we all applaud, we're all, we're all excited. But some people who come into this tank, they pay a price. They pay a price with their family and sometimes with some friends. Some people across the, the world, when they get baptized to make a public declaration of faith, they pay for it dearly in all sorts of different per, ways of persecution. But he says, go public with your faith in the midst of a hostile environment against you. Share about the excellencies and the wonders of God. So in order to have an impact, you must change who you are, realize whose you are, know who they are, go public with your faith. And then number five, win them over by what you do. 
win them over, the non-believing world, by what you do. Look at verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Again, Peter is telling them to be different than those in their culture. He says to them, abstain from the passions of the flesh. Well, what are the passions of the flesh? The Apostle Paul deals with that very clearly in Galatians chapter 5 when he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Just a few verses under this, he talks about what the fruit of the Spirit is and how uh, with the transformation that comes through the work of God in your life, you are different from that. Love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I missed one. <laughs> Kindness. Thank you for being kind and just saying that that way. The passions of the flesh are to stay away from the passions of the flesh. Not only don't do these things, but do what is honorable, he's saying. Now, I've been saying this in the last uh, few sermons on this, this subject of counterculture, but this, we really need to get this if we're going to have an impact on our culture. And it's, it's we're not going to have a, an impact on our culture for what we do not do. Now, we're told not to do the things, the passions of the flesh, and we are to not to do them. Absolutely, that's to be honoring to God and to be holy in our life. But we're not going to have an impact by what we do not do. We're going to have an impact by what we do, by how we touch lives. That's why he says what he says in verse 12. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, amongst the non-believers, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let me put this in 2014 uh, language. So you have a neighbor who's completely against Christianity, has been for a long time. And they speak ill of Christians in the workplace and the neighborhood and everything. And, and one day your neighbor's just going off. Just, you know, in the workplace, she's just telling everybody what a terrible, you know, lot that these Christians are and, and what a phony thing it all is. But then in the middle of it, she pauses and she says, okay, just in, in fairness, I have a neighbor, a neighbor family who are followers of Jesus. And I just have to admit that I, I actually kind of like them. I had a surgery, and uh, they came and brought meals for my family. Uh, when I was recovering, they actually babysit my kids to help me during that time. There are times when I've looked out my window, and uh, they're shoveling my, my driveway and my sidewalk. Um, you know, I, I've, I've just seen them have kindness. They, they don't shove their, their you know, faith down my, my throat. When I went on vacation, they, they watched my dog. I like them. I don't maybe like Christians as a whole, but I like them. That's what Peter's talking about. In, in a culture that is against Christianity, that by your honorable, by your good deeds, by your love for people, by your tangible good works, they're going to take notice of you, they're going to be affected by you, and they're going to be drawn to your Savior because of your good works. It says in the New Living Translation, verse 12, they will see your honorable behavior and they will believe and give honor to God when he comes to judge the world. Because of your behavior, the non-believers at your school, at your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family will be drawn to Jesus to believe in him. Not by what you don't do, but by what you do. I have a staff member here that uh, recently kind of pushed me to, to talk more about 
Jane and my involvement in our neighborhood. The reason for that, we, we're very involved with our neighbors. We love our neighbors. And, and, uh, and he thought it'd be good if I actually gave some actual examples of some things to give some tangible illustrations. But I'm very cautious of that for two reasons. One, a lot of our neighbors now go to Mission Hills. And a second is I don't want it to be like, hey, look at what we do. But in order to help with this, you know, give it just a very practical illustration uh, we, we have uh, a neighbor that we moved into the neighborhood in, in 2002, and in 2003, one of our neighbors who we'd barely met by that time got really sick. Um, you know, if you remember the West Nile um, outbreak of 10 some years ago, well, he was one of those who got that, and he was in uh, the hospital downtown, and he was severe, very severe, didn't know if he was going to make it or not. And so I went down to visit him, although I had barely met him before that, and that started up a, a friendship. Um, when he got back and really couldn't you know, take care of things around his house for a while, we helped out and shoveled s- snow and did things like that. Uh, as the years have gone on, you know, we talked to each other when we were doing yard work, and, and his wife and Jane became very good friends. And um, we had, a number of years ago, Mission Hills, we did a 40 Days of Purpose where we had people in our homes from the community, and they were one of the couples that were in our home for that. Now, on Christmas Eve morning, uh, every year for the last about seven or so years, we've had our neighbors in our home for a brunch. Um, and uh, we have about 40 or so of our neighbors. And, and they always come. And his wife was a delight. I mean, she just was so complimentary of Jane and, and how beautiful the house looked and how good the food tasted and all of that. And everybody loved his wife. She was very sweet. And uh, two Christmas Eves ago, uh, when they were in our home, we took a picture of them. That was a beautiful picture of the two of them. And then that next year, which was this last year, she got terribly sick, and she had a blood disorder, and she died. And um, we went to the funeral, and we've you know, popped in to visit our friend from time to time to see how he's doing. And then Christmas Eve came again a little over a, a month ago, and, and he'd always come. They'd always come, but he, he wasn't there. And so in the middle of it, uh, of the gathering, me and another neighbor, we walked over to his house to, to invite him. And he, he just said, you know, I just, I just can't come. It was the last time we were together as, as a couple in a social setting. And um, it's just too hard. I, I just can't come. And we said, we totally understand. That, that's okay. After that, uh, Jane, uh, a week or so later, uh, got that picture that we'd taken of them the, the, the year before. And it was the last picture they had taken together. And she enlarged it, and she put a nice frame around it. And then one day I took it over to his house about a month ago. And uh, he came to the door, and he had a T-shirt on that had a big hand on it with a middle finger sticking up. It's like, <laughs> welcome, you know. And, um, <laughs> and I gave him the picture, and he had some tears. And we talked for a while, and then he, he wrote us this note. Jane and Mike. I would like to thank both of you for the friendship and kindness that you have shown me in the past year and going back to 2003 when I was in bad shape. You've been much more than neighbors, and I do appreciate that. Thank you also for your thoughtfulness on Christmas Eve. I hope you can understand my weirdness, and I do love the picture and beautiful frame. I'm blessed to have friends like you. Simple. We're not going to have an impact by what we don't do. We're going to have an impact by what we do. It just takes a little care to genuinely love somebody, not because you want to accomplish anything, but just because you love them regardless. So I have a question. So what are you going to do? Let's pray. Lord, we enjoy a a culture that still allows us to meet freely, to speak uh, openly about you. And yet, Lord, at the same time, it's certainly changing and it's getting harder to be a follower of you here. And Lord, there are people that just are against Christians and they're against you. 
And Lord, may they be a little confused because of the Christians that they run into. They're kind and they're helpful and they're loving. And it's not just about what they don't do, but it's what they do. And Lord, may people be drawn to you because of the people who follow you, who have been changed and made different because of the transforming work of you in their lives. So Lord, help me and help each one in this room to know what to do, to genuinely and lovingly touch the lives of other people. To not make it real complicated, but just to reach out and touch. May lives be forever changed because of that. Pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.